Okay guys, so today we're going to go ahead and begin with the progressive era. Remember, this is the era that fixes the corruption and the bad things during the Gilded Age. So we're going to first start off with the agrarian movement. Now the word agrarian is going to mean farmers, right? Farmers, agriculture. Agriculture is farming. So a couple of the farmers' problems that they're going to have is agricultural overproduction. More crops at lower prices. Um, they're also going to encounter higher costs because of the shipping costs of the railroads. Remember, they had that problem uh, before the Interstate Commerce Act was created. Uh, because they can't pay their farms, they're going to have more debt. So the more debt you have, the poorer credit you have, and a higher interest rate, which is when you have loans. And then, of course, at the very end, the environment isn't going to help at all. You have natural disasters, which include droughts, bugs, and floods. Now, when you have all these things together, it's very difficult for the farmers to um, make a living off of their agriculture. And now you have the Grange Movement. It started in 1867, and it's a social club to overcome rural isolation. And remember, rural means ranch, out in the country. Rural isolation, and to talk about new farming techniques, that's how it first started in 1867. Um, ultimately, it's going to lead to economic, which means money, and social reform, and they blamed the railroads for overcharging. So the Grange movement starts off again as a social club where people, the farmers, can come and talk to each other. Remember, rural isolation, they are 160 acres apart from each other. Okay, so again, they blamed the railroads for overcharging, and um, that's how it started. Now, in Munn versus Illinois in 1877, you have the right of a state to regulate businesses that affected public interest within the state. And again, this is where the uh, Interstate Commerce Act comes into play. It says in 1886, the Supreme Court ruled only Congress, which is the legislator, could regulate rates on interstate commerce. Hence, the Interstate Commerce Commission, hence laissez-faire ideals begin to diminish, just like we went over last week. Laissez-faire goes down, that policy. Now, the Populist Party, 1891 to 1896, it's um, only about five years of this, um, and it's a third party. What they do is they provide an outlet for minorities to voice grievances, and that word grievance we've gone over before, it means complaints, and they generate new ideas, just like we went over in class today. Uh, more members equals to a bigger party, the bigger party gets the ideas, all right? Just like we went over in class, let's say you have an equal right or for equal marriage, um, that kind of party, that would be a third party until the two bigger parties pick up those ideas. Now they represented the common man or woman and they wanted to end oppression, injustice, and poverty. Okay, so that's the populist party. And think of the word popular. Who are the popular ones at the time? The most common man. Again, and these are the things they wanted to end. Now, Populist Party um, election campaigns, you're going to have William Jennings Bryan in 1896. He was a Democrat, and he had this cross of gold speech, which we'll actually be going over in class tomorrow. And he got the populist support. Ultimately, McKinley won. He was the person that he went against. He was pro-business, so he helped out the business people. And then in 1900, they go out at it again, and McKinley wins again. And this is the end of the Populist Party. So this is what we're going to be going over in class, um, third parties, the agrarian movement, and um, the Populist Party being the third party of the progressive era.